So many years ago, I wanted to see if I could uh, turn, you know, like a hammer handle, uh, multi-axis hammer handle, because it's pretty easy to turn a dowel, and you can stick a dowel in a chunk of wood or a piece of firewood. You can still pound a lot of stuff. With it. But you know, which fun is that? We like turning. We like new challenges. So this one right here, I can actually I put a date on. Uh, this one I turned 2016, so you know, that's six years ago or so. And uh, there's a few things that I uh, have learned since I made this, but I use this like all the time. I, uh, I pound on my chisels with it. I close paint cans with it. Um, I, I'll take my spur drive and I'll pound that into an end of, of a spindle. Um, make sure I get the dent. And it's just really handy and it's, and it's kind of fun to have one handy. Um, right there by the lathe, and then I got other mallets sitting by my other workbenches, and they don't have to <coughs> move to, to get one. So I figured uh, I should uh, refine my, my technique a little bit, and uh, I spent some time turning these, and, and I wrote down a little uh, sequence of, of steps and everything to, to make these. And we'll start passing these around as the uh, as I do the demo, but um, it's not that it's not that difficult to do, um, and uh, we'll we'll cover that, and hopefully you know a few of you will, will feel the uh, the challenge and, and uh, give it a shot. There's different uh, shapes that you can that you can do. I was inspired by you know two hammers in my toolbox. You got the machinist hammer. Right here, where the uh, this is actually a, a really good one to do for your first one because it's a it's kind of a nice straight line that uh, tapers to a neck and then flares out again just before the head. And then there's the traditional framing, you know, claw hammer, and then that's got uh, two dips in it, so it's wide at the base. It gets a little narrower right here, thicker than narrower before it flares out for the head. And uh, you can you can do both of them. I use these as my patterns because I like them both. And the, the best part about it is you can make it fit to your hand. So if you're into tools, you know, and, and wooden handles, you know that there's a few of the hardwoods that that uh, work out very well for you know, handles. Um, you know, ash is a good one. Hickory is a good one. Um, um, you know, oak works, but I probably, I probably would avoid it if you have access to any of those others. Maple is actually pretty good. It's not real, uh, you know, it's not real colorful. It can be a little plain unless I got uh, one hammer on the table or whatever. I had a nice curly maple chunk, and then um, and you get those stripes in there and they're pretty cool so uh, basically the steps and I, I don't know if you can kind of grab that up here you know you want to figure out what your design is and and this is this is kind of an interesting piece because I took the um, the hammer the ball peen hammer and I measured it out and I got really close to uh, like a sixteenth of an inch and every two inches, you know, I measured that. So it was important to get a good layout. However, you don't have to follow the layout as much as you want to follow the contour. Does that make sense? So like if it was, um, you know, an inch and a half at the one end, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's an inch and five eighths or if it's an inch and three eighths. But what does matter is the measurement next to it has the right taper so that you get the shape over the 12 inches that you want. Does that make sense? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, then you have to mark out the ends. And uh, from my experience, you can do the multi-access uh, spaced one eighth, the, the center points spaced one eighth to three sixteenths apart. So the center point first and then you know, like one eighth inch to the left, one eighth inch to the right, seems to be a pretty good uh, uh, measurement. 
I've been doing 316 just a little bit bigger. It gives you more of a, uh, a fatter oval, I guess is how I would describe it. So then after you turn the, the shape on center, the, the master, I'll call it the master shape because it, it's like a baseball bat kind of a thing, right? Then you want to start turning off center. So you move it to one and you, and you turn it. The first few, I would suggest you plan on changing centers multiple times so that you can kind of creep down on the size that you want. And so then you do the other side and you work your way down. Um, then you turn the dowel end for the mallet. I've been drilling holes in my mallet heads. There's ways that you can keep them from spinning. Um, let's see here. You know, it's so even though it's a round hole where a normal handle, a normal hammer handle has kind of a square or an oval uh, piece on it, uh, you can put the wedge in at the top with some glue. When you pound it in, it's probably not going to move, but it's real easy to um, just punch in. You can just punch in a little hole after you assemble it. And then you can drive like a quarter inch dowel. And I don't drive them all the way through. I'll drive them like three quarters of the way through. So it goes through the handle and then just stops short of coming out. But I pop that through and that, that'll prevent it from turning and coming off and it won't go anywhere. So those are options that you can, you can do on the dowel end. Um, then turn the mallet head, and that's real simple. But you can, you know, you can get a little bit creative. I'll uh, I'll take a look at the mallet on the table. I made it a little less traditional as far as the shape goes. The ones that I have here are kind of like soup cans, and just round the edges, and then you assemble them. So that's kind of the sequence I'm going to follow. And feel free to ask questions. I have a couple of little. Uh, you know, like tips and things that we'll cover along the way. And I guess we're good to go. Tim, when you turn off center, do you turn uh, both ends are off center or just? Correct. Uh, these have, yes, these have been. And that's actually an, an interesting question. I didn't consider that, but you could have, you could have a, a different spacing on the two ends. Yeah, but it's the same eighth inch. Uh, off center on both ends is the way I've been doing it. And this is a All right, so instead of putting through all of these, let's see here. I can go to either one just so I know which one. Yeah. You got it? Um, I got to grab my pencil. So everybody should know how to find the center of their spindles. Everybody uh, has slightly different um, techniques. Uh, if you're not worried about maximizing your wood, um, like let's say you're going to turn something that's an inch and a half and your wood is two inches, well, you got some play, right? Or if you have a three inch chunk, you know, it doesn't matter. You're going to turn it, there's going to be a lot of waste. These happen to be inch and a half um, spindle blanks that came from probably uh, like parts from a, a handrail for stairs, a hose. And so I need to find the center because I don't want to waste any, I don't have any wood to waste. So I have, I don't know if I broke that bit. I have this, uh, this little, uh, little jig and I use this very frequently. But what I found is a lot of my wood, because I hand cut my own wood, you know, like from logs and stuff, uh, either it wasn't square when I cut it. Or it'll shrink and it'll warp, right? It'll it'll uh, deform. So I, if I'm worried about the center, I actually just do all four corners, and I'll put this here, and I'll draw a line, I'll rotate it, and I'll draw a line. Sharp pencil, always use a sharp pencil, 
and then I'll do all four. And then what ends up happening is, I don't know if you can see this, but there's actually four lines and then you end up with a real small little gap between all four right in the middle. And then you pop that with your center punch and you're gonna get pretty close to the to the middle of your wood and, and you won't have to you know, waste much. So that's one of my techniques. The other thing you could do is just try to take your straight edge and then hold it right from corner to corner, right? The, the old traditional way, mark your line and do it the same on the other one. And for some reason, my hands shake too much or something. And I'm always, I'm always missing it, or I don't line it up quite right, or I get halfway through drawing my line and it moves, and I get an L. And I can never find the center of an L. I just, I'm just still struggling with that one. Um, so then, you put the center, you, you pop the center hole in there, and then I'll measure, uh, you know, the three sixteenths, and you can just leave it right there, and I'll try to come back. The same spot. What's that? Okay. And so then I'll hold that for the three sixteenths and I'll go left and right. So that all seems fine until you do a bunch of these and you realize that uh, the wood grain will mess with you, right? So you take your you take your um, you're all, and you put it exactly on the crosshairs, and you give it a pop, and all of a sudden the tip just kind of slides off. Well, it's easy to move it over a sixteenth of an inch, and then you're going to have a kind of an off, uh, an off-centered handle. So what I found out is that if I do, if I do the two, are, are you doing it now? Yeah. If I do the two on the sides first, then it's easier to pop the middle hole in between them. So even if I'm off a little bit on the 3 sixteenths, maybe a little long, a little bit short, if I do the outside two first and I pop them in, then it's a little bit easier to take my, my center punch and then pop it right in the middle. Does that make sense? So, but it can make a difference if you're making a smaller handle and, and, you're, and you're dealing with this. Bottom line is, you want the spacing to be exact on both sides to keep, um, you know, your handle balanced. But don't worry about it on your first couple because uh, the first couple that I made uh, actually it went into my neighbor's fire pit. <laughs> but that's you know that's part. I just I just saw a new one. I was in AAW uh, site and. Uh, there was a little story about a musician who will play the cards, you know, he will do me, you know, I'm not going to sing. But, you know, they do that all the time to warm up. But as woodworkers, we don't warm up, right? We always want to put the chunk of wood on there. We want to, we want to turn that final thing. So remember, it's good to warm up. So get a couple of scrap pieces of wood, turn them, get what you like, and then burn them. Turn them and burn them. There, I got to find my hand. So I had this really cool hammer. Did I ever tell you that I, I made this hammer a long time ago and I just use it like all the time? So I'll pop that on here. And I'll do all three right away just to get a little bit of a, of a grip. I don't have to remove that later. So the first thing that we're going to do then is we're going to, oh, we didn't talk about the layout. Um, this will go quick, but what, I'll, what I like to do is, is I'll figure out how long I want the handle. And this is a 12 inch to, uh, from the bottom of the handle until the head. So that's 12 inches. And you can use any number you want. I just grabbed two inches. So every two inches, I measured, I measured the handle so that I know what diameter I'm going to make my first cut. And so I have all of these measurements on here, and, and then you can follow. Now the downside to this, right, is that if you go from, 
from inch and an eighth to the white part on here is, is one and an eighth. If I just follow that all the way across, you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna get the same shape that your example was because you're just connecting dots. So we're gonna trim down the spindle to the different measurements on here, and then we're gonna, you know, clean that all up to connect the dots. So if you go every two inches, you're gonna miss the peaks and the valleys. That's kind of where I'm going with. So make sure that you find out where your widest measurements are and your narrow measurements, and then we'll put that on here as well. So I'll put these on in black every two inches, then we'll come back, and then the, uh, the narrow spot I'll put in red, and then this wide spot just below the head I'll put in red. And it's a good visual reminder on your first couple because I've, I've cut them the wrong way. You know, I've made, I've made mistakes on these, but it helps a lot where you can visually say, oh, that's the low spot and that's the high spot. And then if you're also, if you're measuring one of those, then you would measure the narrow one. And in this particular case, it was an inch and a sixteenth on the narrow measurement, and it was an inch and seven sixteenths. So when you subtract them, you end up with um, three eighths difference on the on the wide part of the oval compared to the narrow. And so when you're putting in two dots, then they have to be three eighths inch apart, or it's three sixteenths inch um, left and right of the center. So first we'll round it out um, using the uh, spindle roughing gouge. And actually I use the spindle roughing gouge for almost almost everything on this uh, handle except for the ends when, I, when I'm uh, cutting them down or when I'm trying to finish the edge. And uh, some of the, maybe the tighter curves if you have any. But it works really good and uh, I can use it almost as well, or it creates a surface almost as well as the, the skew. Now we'll go into submarine mode. to do with the uh, the spindle roughing gouge you know like up here we got all these corners yet and then over here I'm actually round already because you don't hear anything this tool cuts really good going downhill so if you start on the end and then you keep coming back that half inch to inch and a half you'll you'll have a nice feel for when the stock is uh, getting rounded out You can feel it in your skin. section, start taking later cuts, 
And this is where you can start to use your um, your spindle welting gouge like a like you would a skew. If you rest the bevel on there, you can take a real nice planing cut. And I've said this before in other demos, but roughing it out like this is, is like the best opportunity you have for playing the scales, you know. We just talked about practicing and getting a nice cut. Um, you know, for the most part, I got to leave it here on this end because that's the end of the handle. But from about the middle to the left, you know, I can just, I can keep working on my technique and not worry about the diameter of the wood. Bumps here as well. Okay. Huh. Still here. I thought I brought my first grade pencil with me. It's not. There. So if we looked at the uh, the drawing up here, you know, every two inches is what we're going to measure. I would probably take about a half an inch of waste on both ends or plan for that. Um, you know, you're going to want to add one inch for waste, and then you're going to want at least as as much as the uh, diameter of your head, the mallet head. So. Um, you know, whatever this is, so let's say that's two and a half. You're going to probably want three inches here, plus a half, plus a half, so you four and a half inches longer than the handle that you want to go. I don't know if you can see this. Probably not. So if you do, though, I can move it to the other side. Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to put a random, a random mark here about a half of an inch in. You see that? Now what I did, and you're not going to be able to see it, is this is the end of the tool rest right here. And I put that end of the tool rest right in line with that pencil mark. And so now I can just, I always had trouble holding a ruler up here and trying to mark what I wanted to do. So now I just take my ruler with the hook end and it just sits right here. And so then I go two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Okay? So those are my marks that we have up on the top of this picture up in here. But then down below we want to get the peak in the valley. So I have nine and five eighths of an inch. I'm going to put a, a, a red mark, and again, this is this is it helps keep um, me focused when I'm looking at it, and I'm you know I'm removing wood because red line means something a little different. And then the peak was two inches after that, so then I'll just cheat a little bit, and I'll go two inches and, and that. So this will be the, the narrowest part of the handle, and this one is going to not be the widest part, but it will be the widest part just below the head of the mallet. The other widest part in this particular design is the first one, which, you know, actually would be this one. Well, I use these little six-inch um, rulers frequently in just about all my projects that are, you know, smaller. And um, I had these little these little clips right here from my framing square. Anybody got those to cut out stair treads or the stair stringers? And it works out really good because I can clip them on my ruler and I can I can set them. You know, I, normally I'd set them down here, and I probably will as I get rolling. But um, there, you want them set down there, please. And the nice part is that I can rest one caliper jaw against that block real easy. 
And then as I bring the other, as I'm adjusting my caliper, I can tell when I get the size that I want. So I was always struggling trying to hold this on a ruler and then get the right, get the right size so that when I index my, my wood. So that, that worked out kind of good. The first measurement is uh, one and seven sixteenths. And spoiler alert, I'm already below that on the end, but like I said, it's just more important that you get that you get the uh, you know, the general shape, which you need to have good measurements to you know to get that kicked off. The next measurement is one and three eighths. <laughs> and so now I'm going to cut that. When you're when you're cutting like this um, to get to your depth, sometimes your uh, calipers are might be a little wide. Uh, if you go real deep, a lot of times the calipers will start to catch on the shoulders of the butt. So it's a good habit if you're going to be going very deep to kind of wiggle your hand a little bit to make that groove just a little bit wider, and that'll that'll help. Keep your uh, your calipers engaged. So I'll get hung up. All right, so that one. It's inch and an eighth, and then. On my drawing here, the inch and the eighth is used again over on the shoulder by this uh, second red mark. So now we're down to one inch. And again, this is on the black mark for the pencil mark. And then the uh, the other red one is fifteen, sixteen. So it's just a hair. So here, smaller, and I'm just going to give it a small turn on the caliper. And that's all you remember with this small spot. I'm 
I'm going to do real quick here is I'm going to remove a little bit more of this because I want to make these I want to make these two red again so everybody can keep track of it of the different parts we got. Oh, and then I forgot to do the shoulder. So this one's red, and this one's red. And you can just pretend all the others are, are black. And this I'm just going to move forward because eventually this section up here is um, three quarters of an inch to fit the hole. And uh, I just go into the front of the side. Okay. So now we got all of these uh, cuts in here. So we have an index of the size. And if we did it correctly, you know, there, there's a nice smooth transition in diameter from the largest end here all the way down to the first red mark, which would be the narrowest uh, part of the handle. So I'm going to rough this out, try to get these lines. In fact, I'm going to fill those in anyways, just because it's easier for everybody to see them. And this is where you can get really nice cuts with the spindle rub and gouge um, if you uh, if you practice your technique and, and basically you're using it kind of like a skew, but it's it's got the the curved cutting edge on it, which is a little more forgiving than the straight edge on a skew. So I'm not going to cut any more on the first one. Um, We'll bring it down to each of these marks. But here's another little another little tip. So let's say I'm going to use an eighth inch as the example just because it's a easy measurement to relate to. If this groove right here is an eighth inch deeper than this than the diameter over here, you know, we can't very easily take one swipe and and leave this the way it is. And get a nice clean cut at the at this uh, deeper index, right? So if you try to do that, you're, you're either going to get all kinds of bumps. You're going to start getting a lot of tear out when the, the cutter gets deeper. So in your mind, just tell yourself, I'm going to do like three cuts, or I'm going to do four cuts. And if I'm going to do three, and they're all the same depth, you know, you can mark this into three sections and it doesn't have to be you know perfectly free but you're going to take one cut from the pencil mark to the depth you want and and not worry about reaching the depth you're just going to take a nice smooth cut then you're going to move it over and you're going to take one more and by doing that second cut the middle here has one pass and this deeper one has had two passes so you're automatically should be twice as deep as you were before you started, right? Does that make sense? And then if I take it a third time down, I uh, just barely cut this this end with one pass. This had two passes, and then this had three. So that's one way to kind of gauge your depth. Try to keep that nice smooth blend because you want, you know, when you end up with this, um, you know, with, with this rough mark right here. You want that transition to be as smooth as possible all the way down. And then I'll leave those marks for now because we can come back and clean them up. Once 
once you get a smooth surface on here, then that bevel rubs real nicely and you can help to, to uh, reduce the vibration and, and improve the surface when we get to the next group so that we're ready for the next step. And then on this one, it's so deep that I'm actually going to do a release cut over here. So I'll do the same thing. So right now it's starting to vibrate because we have a thin piece of wood on there. I'm just going to clean up some, some of these splinters that I got. And the edges make them a little smoother. And then if, um, if you're comfortable, you can hold your hand on the spindle while you're cutting. Just hold it lightly. You don't want to hold so tight that you burn yourself. But just a little bit of pressure will help reduce some of that vibration. A sharp tool and a, and a slow um, cross cut as well. So now this first red mark was the lowest spot, so we're still going downhill. So now this should be the lowest, you know, the narrowest part of the spindle. And to keep your, your wood from uh, uh, tearing out and getting a rough surface, I'm going to change the direction and come from the left because I'm going to have larger diameter on the left <clears throat> going down into that smaller diameter. Okay. Give so one more cut right here first. And I'm not left handed, so I don't have the same dexterity that I have going the other direction. But it's a good, it's a good uh, technique to, to practice. There's a lot of times when you need to do circular form and that's right here and basically it's this piece so this I'll while I finish cutting the shoulder on here uh, I'll pass that around just so you get a feel for the first step on getting it rounded out So now that it's round, this is uh, actually a very important first step because it gives you that shape. And this is the, uh, the same as that ball peen hammer. And the smoother this is, the better results you're going to have when you turn it off center. But before I turn it off center, just a couple of things. Um, one is we're going to try to take off about 3 sixteenths of an inch on the two sides, right? So what I like to do is I'll measure, can you see the butt end here pretty good? I'll measure about an eighth of an inch, three sixteenths of an inch from the edge, from the corner, in. And then I'll mark a circle on here. As I start to turn it off center now, 
this, the two sides will slowly shrink to that second circle. So right now I have one circle. It's the diameter. It's the diameter of the wood, right? It's right here, right on the corner. You can kind of see that. And so then I'll take eighth inch to three sixteenths of an inch. It doesn't have to be exact because it's just a guide for, for you to know when to stop cutting. And I'll put a second one right there. So as I start to cut it off center, you'll see how, how handy that can be. And then uh, there's another one I forgot to show you, another little tip. And, um, and this is to find the top and bottom, we'll call it the dead center. So the oval is going to have the top dead center right up here and the bottom dead center down here. And it'll have the same, you know, center points on the other end. And that is where we're going to uh, use, that's the point we're going to use for our target. So what I did, or what I will do, is I will draw a line on here, and it's really handy the first time you do it. So you can see the black line. We'll draw that line on here before we start turning off center. And then just because we have the cameras, actually, did I bring my chalk? Yeah. So I brought some chalk because I can color the wood. I can color the wood with the chalk, and then you can see a real nice line that helps uh, indicate when you get the profile you want. So I'll pass that one around too. That's the step we'll be doing next. So in order to do that, you take your, um, let's see, you take your your center points and you, you hold them horizontal, all three, and then you just go on the top and then you mark something that's, today it's just going to be close. If I was, if I would have remembered, I would have done them all was still square. And then the same off the other side. So we'll take these two lines, or these two dots, and then, actually, Jerry, would you mind? Yeah, just hold it right on that line there. This is actually a little, this is the most difficult part of the whole process. Oh, and then the other thing too is uh, it actually helps if you're not going to be drawing these lines and using the chalk. It helps to sand it before you move to the next point because if you sand it, you only got to go to like maybe 150 or 180. You get it nice and smooth. Um, when you start making the offset cuts, the smoothness of the sand marks, you know, that, that nice clean surface, will do the same thing as the chalk. So the chalk is going to highlight it right now. Um, but if you didn't want to do chalk, I would suggest that you, you know, you take something, a block of wood with, with 100 grit on it or 120 grit, and you hold it on there. And uh, now that, that's kind of what I was doing, like with this thing right here. I would hold it on here and I would just go back and forth and buff that up and get a nice smooth surface. Then when you cut it later, you can tell exactly where the two different surfaces intersect. You have a, like a little corner or a little edge there. All right. And then we know that we're going to be uh, trying to get the sides to come up close to this mark. This this line across the top, uh, we we don't want to cut off at all. In fact, I would say your target to start with should be about a quarter of an inch on both sides of it. And you can see, and maybe you can, that my tool marks, because it shattered a little bit from the vibration, um, you can see those tool marks on 
underneath the jaw. Okay, so we got the rounded out blank all set. All we're gonna do is just re remount it with one of the other holes. It's just real simple. So I do like taking the hole, the holes, and I'll just grab one, throw it on the top, and then you know that when you get to this side over here, the one on the top is the other center point that you want to use. Okay, so we talked about that little circle. That's going to be my guide. If you, as it gets close to the, uh, the rest right here, this is that point that I'm going to be cutting down toward. I'll probably leave that mark on. A good chance I don't have to cut that off. Um, and if you if you ever turn live edge bowls, right? We're turning, we're cutting to a shadow, so you can see the wood flying, and it pays to get used to trying to read that shadowed edge because it's it's different than having a hard edge. And then the other technique too, um, and there's two points that contribute to a good cut in this case. Um, one is find a comfortable way to hold your gouge and let it ride on the tool rest. So I like to put my finger um, so up underneath the ridge that's on here, like right this ridge right here. So I'm trying to put my knuckle right there and hold my tool so that as I'm going across, I want a really nice smooth cut. It creates a lot less sanding later, and it gives you a better idea if you're following the form that, that you're trying to hit. Up. And then the other thing too, and you know. Right, Lynn, it's the dance, right? We have to do the dance. We got to move our hips. So if you can, in your mind, um, freeze your upper body above your waist, once you once you find that cutting edge on your on your uh, spindle gouge, kind of freeze your wrists, your elbows, kind of hold it there. And now just take your knees and your hips, and then you're going to be sliding it this way without moving your shoulders, your elbows, your wrists. That's the key, and you'll get a lot smoother cut and try to keep it at a nice, even pace, because if you stop, that's the other thing too, which actually, if you stop, if you've got a nick on your, tool, this is just an old candle, you got a nick on your tool rest or something, and it, it'll all of a sudden, you get this little dip in your handle, and you can just tell people, I did that on purpose for finger grips, because I want my hand to fit on there, but if you do that, make sure that you know they're spaced equally. <laughs> they'll, they'll catch on real quick if, if your fingers are seven inches apart. Oops. A little too close on one end. So again, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna try to take like three passes, right? I'm not gonna do it all at once. It, it gives me a little chance to recover as I go in. And then I'm gonna remount it, do the other side, and I expect to come back to the first one, you know, and, and do that back and forth maybe twice just to get a nice shape. Right here. Does anybody know why? Anybody know why I stopped at that red mount? No spot. No spot, yeah. So I'm going to go back to the left now and cut down to that little spot. And the good thing is that this is a really short cut because I'm not good cutting left to right. Take a look at it here real quick, see how much we got. So um, right here, um, let's see here. 
right here we started cutting into the chalk so we're getting i mean we're getting there um if you look at your um your edge you know you could take you can take your ruler a little bit you can say oh yeah i'm following that pretty close so i got a nice straight transition i did two passes on this little shoulder up on the on the head side <clears throat> so that's a little deeper and you can see uh, you can see right here that that chalk edge is well defined and my next pass will probably do the same on, on the rest here <clears throat> And so I'm, I'm getting a little uncomfortable over on my right side as I'm starting because, you know, like 10 inches is actually quite a, a long cut to go all the way down. So I'm uncomfortably uh, balanced on my right leg right now. And as soon as my dog is cutting, I'm going to just move my hips over to the left. diameter changed a little bit on here and I was actually too high to take the same amount of wood once I got to this middle so I have to I actually got to come back again and do this my tool rest should probably be just a little bit lower so now you can see it's hopefully so now you can see the uh yeah right that's pretty good right you can see the well-defined chalk mark on there so now i'm getting I'm kind of getting to where i want if i look at this distance and this distance would be from the chalk mark down here to the center line and about three eighths of an inch you want to get a little bit closer but i'm okay with that for right now if you look on the end you can see i'm getting close to my reference circle so you know that we have little ways that we can go yet. Yeah. I'll take one more pass. Actually, I'm going to drop the tool rest just a hair. Looking in my shadow, the floor is giving me the right um, contrast, and I can see that it's pretty good, but I got a couple little bumps right in here. center point and we're going to do the same thing all over again if you look at, if you look at the, uh, the line here I'm about about an eighth of an inch up here and that would normally be my target about an eighth of an inch off the center I got a little bit low down in here. Um, it'll be fine. Again, these reference lines are just to get you in the ballpark because as you as you taper this down and then you sand it, you know, basically you can customize it to whatever 
it turns out to be. It's like most of our bowls, we don't typically have the shape in our head before we turn them. <laughs> so we're way ahead on that one. Now before, what I do, like three, almost four passes, I think, on there. So in my mind, I want to do the same number of passes to try to get close. So we'll start with three and then we'll check it. So you can see, well, first of all, our lines were drawn when I eyeballed the marks. So we're probably not quite as close to top dead center and bottom dead center as we wanted. But I did get both sides to be fairly close. Um, this one looks really good. We got about eighth of an inch on both sides of the line. And then this one looks eh, a little worse. So this one's got about an eighth on one side. And, uh, not on the other but just remember that contributors to making this happen is my center points and my offset points have to all be exactly the same because if there's any variation on that it'll show up on this in the, on this line and this is just to give you a, a target you know once we start sanding this it all goes away and nobody will ever know that um, you didn't hit your uh, reference point but that's basically ready. And uh, that's what we can do is we can pass that one around because that's the one we just watched. <clears throat> and then I'll grab this one. <clears throat> so I put it back on the center points right now. <clears throat> And uh, I'm going to sand it so that we get, you know, a nice, I'm only going to sand like a little bit because we don't want the dust all over. But uh, I think it's important that you understand that the sanding part and the tool you use for sanding is an important part of getting the finish you want, right? If you have a long straight line, then you want a large flat surface to sand it so that you can you can get that uh, smooth surface the way you want it. If you have a you know a curved surface, then what you want to do is uh, find a find a way to get something of a similar arc, a similar curve, and uh, use that to to get 
the final shape. So this this is actually one of my uh, my favorite sanding tools. Uh, I just went to Fleet Farm and I bought a five inch disc. Um, and then I glued this pad on here. I've, I've had this at the meetings before. This was just a piece of craft uh, foam that I picked up at Hobby Lobby. And I used um, contact cement on both surfaces, squished it on. And then once it you know, gave it time to set, then I just turned it on and I took a real heavy, like a 60 grit sandpaper, and I just held it on here and sanded it round. The foam will last a long time if you spray fixative on it. So there's this, it's basically a lacquer. It's like a flat lacquer, but they call it artist fixative. So if you were doing like a charcoal drawing and you, you've got the charcoal piece to look just the way you want it, the artist would spray on top of that charcoal and then it doesn't smudge, right? But it, it's a good surface for the um, adhesive back sandpaper that will stick to it. And I'll spray fixative on here you know, once or twice a year. You know, I'll probably knock out anywhere from 10 to 20 bowls between spraying it. And it holds really well. It allows me to peel it off. And the whole concept is I don't want to push hard anyway, right? Because if you push too hard, then you're creating uh, sand grit marks on your wood that you don't want. So it allows you to sand lightly. Um, it's, it's really easy to use, and these of back sandpaper is actually cheaper, a little bit cheaper than the loop back. So I'm just going to do, I'm just going to do maybe the first four to six inches on this on this one side, and uh, and that'll just give you a clue on how on how nice it, it works to get uh, the wood to a surface that you want to put your hand on. It around that piece again that's that's what you're looking for and you'll you'll see it on the end okay, while I'm waiting for that to come back we'll just talk about we'll talk about the head real quick um, you know you can so the first couple that I made were kind of tin you know soup can kind of heads and uh, and then it's like, oh, I can, you know, I can do better. I can do different. So uh, I grabbed this shape. This is a small chunk of curly um, maple that I had. Uh, it had a little bit of mineral staining and spalting to it, a very minimal spalting. Um, but I thought this would make a nice hammer for my chisel. So once in a while, I, I do some carving with the hand chisels. And this turned out real to be a real nice size for that. Um, I made a little extra diameter because this uh, ash is not real heavy. And I thought about um, using cactus juice. Ed brought me all the equipment to do it before the, um, uh, two weeks ago he brought it. And I was playing around with that just a little bit and I decided not to just because it's, it's going to be a, a multi-access demo, not a not a, uh, a resin demo, but that would add extra durability and weight to the heads on these. So if you're serious about making uh, mallets that you want to use a lot, that would be a great option. Um, I have not tried to uh, drill the hole first and then turn the head. But, you know, you would have to have the blank nice and square and find the center, drill the hole right on the center, you know, chuck it up and then turn it, which is fine. That's an easy way to do it. Instead, what I did was, um, oh, man, did I, forget? I did, oh, here it is. I have a, a center, uh, a 
a 45 jig for my drill press. And it's, I just took a chunk of a two inch pine and I ripped it at 45 degrees and then I screwed it to the bottom of this board. I can put this on my drill press and then I bring the, the, uh, the point down for the drill bit, put it right on the center of this uh, 245 degree angles. And then I'll clamp this down and I lock the tape. So I know that that's gonna come straight down in. And then if it's shaped like a soup can, right, then you have some nice edges on here and it'll sit pretty good and you can drill through it. If it's like this one, it wanted to rock a lot and a little tougher to do that. So if I was to make a round head or something, I'd try to, I'd try to drill the hole before I turn the head. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard to hold. Yeah, Mark. Turn the basic cylinder first, drill the hole, and then final shape. Oh, yeah. There you go. I could. That's a that's a great idea. So turn the soup can first, drill your hole, and then contour it and make it whatever shape you want. Good, good one. I like mm -hmm. that. But anyways, this is this has been real handy for me. I've, I've used it a bunch of times. This is actually my second one now. I wore the first one out. I use it for a lot of other things, not just the, not just the uh, hammerheads. All right, did that first one come back? That was this one, right? All right. So let's see. So we turned it on center. We turned it off center. Now what we're going to do is we're going to we'll make the doll end on here. And so that has to be, in this case, three quarters of an inch diameter so that it fits inside that hole. We go back to centers. And we're taking that out. I feel like I should be wearing a tutu. <laughs> Is that somebody's fault or is that the artisan center? I don't know. It smells like turning music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So as it gets, as this gets thinner, obviously you're prone to more vibration. Uh, that's why I leave this part for last because if you had, you know, a three, four inch chunk of three quarter inch um, uh, hickory in this case, um, you're gonna get more vibration. Uh, the good thing though is when you're turning off center and it just keeps hitting and then it goes, it doesn't get the harmonic vibration like you would if you were holding it uh, on a round cylinder. So that part's good. We're gonna do the same thing, you know, use a parting tool and a calipers to get down close. On my uh, my little ruler here, I'll mark it off on three quarter. Just out. I usually go like a hair over. So if you want to cut it down to three quarters, you know, I might make it. What would that be? Twelve, so maybe just a thin thirteen sixteenths, because that gives you a little more uh, leeway. Not, has anybody ever, you know, went to cut like this and then your caliper is like slides over really easy and you're going like, oh, oh, yeah, that, that's what I try to avoid now. Uh, I still got a couple flats up here, so I'm going to use the spindle roughing gouge first. Get her down to size.
So we want it to be three quarters of an inch right next to the shoulder. So I'm going to clean up the square edge. I'm going to cut into that shoulder just a little bit because I like having a little surface on the handle where the uh, hammer head can sit against. And again, now anything you do to the, look at that, I did it already, right? So that first, my first cut is by accident. Because we're making a dowel here, I like to have a lot more um, reference points so that I can connect the dot. You can do whatever you feel comfortable with, but three quarters of an inch to an inch works out pretty good for me. Accident. This is one of the first tools I bought by accident. They didn't have a real, they didn't have a real spindle roughing gouge, and so this looked close. So I thought maybe I could use it. It's very flat. Um, it's kind of like like a bent skew almost. I sharpen it the same. Uh, I use the same uh, bevel on the uh, spindle roughing gouge as I do on this one, but you can see it's a very shallow curve. But it works out good um, for trying to get, you know, flat, straight surfaces. You could use your spindle roughing gouge, your uh, regular spindle gouge. You could use your skew, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. I like to just barely see these different reference types. So I know I'm going to be pretty close, and then I'll do uh, I'll do one more uh, what I'll call a, kind of an accurate. So before I cut them just a little oversized, and this is right at two quarters. My uh, inexperience on doing this kind of show is because too many times I turn them smaller than I want it, and then they don't fit good. And so I just do it twice. I'm suspecting that this will still be just a little bit oversized and it's a little thick right at the bottom. Um, I like that last half of an inch. If you can hit, um, push that on to be, to be nice and firm. Um, but like I said before, we can always pin it with a dowel and the wedge on the top. Um, secures that head pretty well too. All right, so let's see here. Now, instead of going through all the steps of fitting, I left these apart so that you could see what I did. 
So this particular one, I still got you know the uh, the three center points on the bottom. I cut the top flange off, uh, so that would be you know, on the headstock side. I cut this off, and then I made my own wedges uh, out of hickory. So they're just stuff uh, you could you could get like a little tapered jig, you know. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw those in like woodworking mm -hmm. magazines and stuff. You just kind of cut one at a slight taper, and, and I cut my own, you know, shims once in a while because, you know, I need them and I, I just don't have them from the store. Um, these would be a little bit shorter, but the important thing for here is to, you know, cut it so that uh, you can insert it in the end and also have some type of a slot in your handle that is of similar uh, uh, angle because it right down at the bottom of this turn it this way. right down at the bottom here is a single curve from my bandsaw but up at the top I actually removed some stock that was you know just a little bit narrower than what's in there um, this particular wedge I would probably not even probably I will if you look at it right now, if I pound this in, by the time it starts to separate um, these two pieces of wood at the top and put pressure on the head, the bottom of this wedge is going to bottom out. So you probably won't get enough pressure. So now that I know what what the fit is, I'll just put a little mark on here. And in this particular case, I'll cut about you know three eighths to a half of an inch right off of this wedge and then glue it put a little bit of glue on this surface a little bit of glue on the head uh, in here and then uh, i'll put it on i did not drill i drilled this little quarter inch hole only through the the head at this point and it's hard to see on the camera but it actually does go through the hole and oh, yeah. you can kind of see it right there it does go through the hole and just enters on the other side. So once I get once I get this on, and I'll, I'll apply like I said, just a light light fit of glue so that you can you know see it and feel it on both surfaces is best because um, you, you by doing a light surface or a light uh, film of glue on both surfaces, uh, the penetration goes into the wood cells on both and then. You get the better adhesive qualities of the glue without all the squeeze out. So that's you know a good way to minimize your squeeze out. Is just make sure you have wet surfaces on both sides. And then I would put it where I want it. You know, you align the handle, align the head, and put a little glue on the on the wedge. And then I'll just pound that down nice, nice and tight. Drill a quarter inch hole through here. Pop in a dowel. Um, I cut this off on the I'll cut this off on the bandsaw, cut that off on the bandsaw, and then sand and flush. Um, I did bring I have that one blank for a head here. I mean I can I can cut the ends on this if yeah. would you like me to do that? Anybody uh, play around with trying to get a nice flat surface on end grain? Mm -hmm. Want me to do that? I didn't know how much time we have or what the interest was. We'll do it real quick. So this is this is where I was when I started to uh, put resin on here. I was going to do the, the cactus juice and then, then bake it. So when I tried to dry this out, I got checking on both ends of this. And I had some light cracks. And so then I called up Ed and I go, Ed, what did I do wrong? And uh, <clears throat> I went to another couple pieces and I started drying those. I actually wrapped tin foil just on the end, you know, like a half of an inch on both ends. And then I stuck them in and I, I cooked them like an hour at a time, but three times over the course of one day. Got them nice and dry. And I think that would have worked out good. So if, I, if I'm going to do that in the future, I'll just wrap the ends with tin foil just to make sure that I don't dry the ends out faster than I dry the middle. 
<clears throat> but cutting the end grain is actually another good uh, skill builder. Oh, and then I didn't show you the sanding these things. <clears throat> Again, I didn't want to make a lot of a lot of dust, but <clears throat> it actually goes it goes really nice. So the the different the different tools you can use is the sanding disc, like I just had. And did everybody get to see that one piece that floated around? I mean, it does a nice job of just knocking the high spots down. If you don't have that, you know, just a block, you know, something like this. I did my first three or four. <laughs> I did my first year for it with this with this block and because it's it's got a semi-firm like a closed cell foam on here I mean you can see yeah, you can kind of see, probably not but there's ridges on here from the vibration because when I was cutting got a little vibration and it took like no time at all to knock those off with a block like this. And so this is what I do to, to get that down. Like I said before, sand it when it's in the round. That'll be a big benefit for you. Because <clears throat> if you take if you take it when it's in the round, it's easy to sand because it's uh, it's not gonna be pounding against your, your hand or your sandpaper <clears throat> before you do the sides. And then, uh, and then once you get the high spots and low spots all aligned through sanding, um, I frequently just, where's that other piece here? I'll just take, you know, like work my way up 100 to 150, 120, 150, and let's keep that. And then you just go like this. And it does a wonderful job of getting that. Uh, this to uh, shape. I'll shut it off, reverse the direction, and then go the other way. Because of your your bumps on here, you know they're going to have different pressure on the sandpaper, so you want to go both directions in order to smooth that out. But it works really well, and uh, it, it goes fairly quickly. Russia. Yeah. The Russians. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. Yeah. We got a Packer game or something. They're practicing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So any questions so far? Okay. All right, I dabble in on, on the edge when I do this kind of stuff. When I get close to cutting them off, I'll get these little ends probably way too small. I've had a couple that I've that I've toasted, but um, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. And I do that with the bottoms of my bowls. So you always have the the, uh, the dimple on the bottom when you reverse chuck them. And, and quite frequently, I'll get them down to like, a, like an eighth of an inch in diameter. And then I'll pop it off, and then I take it off with a chisel. It's a lot less sanding, and it's a little, uh, it keeps the end, especially on the end grain, it keeps the end grain looking more consistent all the way across the surface. So, my tool of choice is just a spindle gouge. Um, what you end up with is the, the first time you do these surfaces, you know, your work, it's kind of like a, like, a, like a half a sphere, and then you have to leave this top edge, and you have to keep trying to get it flatter and flatter and flatter. So, that's the, uh, that's the challenge. Especially when you turn it the wrong way. It's even more. <laughs> but then I have backwards gouge that I'll use on something. Yeah. And just yesterday when I was doing one of these, I uh, in fact the one I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a confession. This was gonna be a soup can, but I had a catch. So <laughs> so then I, I decided, hey, 
Nobody will know that I made the ends smaller <laughs> if I could do them both the same. So, kids, outside this room, it doesn't go anywhere, but this was a soup can. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have not mastered my, my uh, it's the entry point, right? It's like when you first start getting around that corner and you want to take a real nice thin slice off and you're feeling really comfortable and I said, it takes off to the left or the right. Yeah, my, my eyes have just been... Does that hurt you? No. Yeah. So I like to, to play with the, uh, the edge a little bit because I want a nice round edge. And you can sand this to get it the way you want it, but you know, cut a nice bevel, get a feel for how your, uh, your gouge is going to cut. And I'll do, in this particular case, and I think you can see it, I put two facets on there, and they're real small. So that's given me a, a, a feel for how I'm going to get in here and cut. So once I pass that corner, it's a little bit safer and less likely to get a catch and run out. And then you have to move your body and, and pick up your hand as you're going through the cut. <clears throat> Once you get down, then you got to get rid of the, the nib down on the end here. At this point, I'll, if you can see that flange, right? It's right um, in the thing here. The flange right there, it's eh, maybe a sixteenth of an inch thick. So I like to keep cutting that in half. So that I know when I make the final cut, it's going to peel off a very, you know, just thousandths of an inch. Um, and it'll help reduce any tear out that you get. So I'll clean this up a little bit more. I don't have a lot of wood to work with, but I'm pretty close right now. If I, if I cut, cut this off, Blade right now. Oops. You can kind of see. I mean, it's not really tear out. It's probably some burnishing from the tool, but I can see all these rings, and it would be my goal to avoid that. So I'm going to try to do one full final cut. And then again, you don't want it flat and you don't want too much curve, right? So you want just enough so that if you're using it as a mallet, it's not going to slide off, you know, or roll off. And then you don't want it, you know, concave either. So I'm going to try to do one full cut from the edge all the way to the middle. And by leaving that little bit of a flange on there, um, I like that to remind it out because I cut this off on the bandsaw, and that gives me that gives me a line that I try to hit when I'm on there. So that would be, yeah, I can get rid of this now. So I mean, that would be what I try to do on the end. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Any any questions? Repeat. When you cut the wedge slot, make sure that it's 
Yeah, thank you. Did everybody catch that? So the wood, the, your wood grain, let's see, hold it right there. So the wood grain is really strong this way, right? And if you've ever split firewood, you know that this way it's, it'll easily pop apart. So this wedge has to be 90 degrees to the grain. Got to be perpendicular. If I turn the wedge this way and I pounded it together, my head will come apart. So don't forget to do that. So which is the other point, which falls right in line with what Pete said. You got to make sure that you hold your, uh, it's kind of easy uh, if you make the two act, you know, the multi-axis handle. If you set it on your bandsaw, it'll automatically sit on its side and it'll sit the way you want to cut it. So, you know, that has to go up. However, you know, if you're a little anal, like I can be at times, you want to make sure that you can maybe clamp this end so that it doesn't roll and then try to make sure that you hit the middle because it, it's just more pleasing when you look at it uh, down below. 